Ludger is uh, and I. We started training together uh, in in Professor Trimble's lab uh, many many moons ago. I think we were both in mid training then, and uh, we've continued to stay in touch uh, both as individuals and families. Ludger is a professor of uh, uh, psychiatry and psychotherapy and head of experimental neuropsychiatry um, in the University of Freiburg. And he also, like Professor Gangadhar, has been there right from the time he was a medical student. I don't think, uh, Ludger, you left, but to come to UCL uh, yeah, for a yeah. year. I think you've always uh, been in, in uh, Albert Ludwig University. Yeah. He has over 210 uh, peer-reviewed publications, a number of important books, many, uh, many publications in the German language. And he is a very comprehensive neuropsychiatrist in that he takes interest from uh, developmental disorders, autism, ADHD, right up to conditions like epilepsy, Parkinson's, dementia. And uh, he has a great interest also, I know, in the autoimmune causes of neuropsychiatric conditions and in schizophrenia in particular, of which he uh, now organizes a pan-German conference, uh, which I believe is extremely popular. So with all those uh, few words of introduction, I have great pleasure in inviting Ludger to make his first presentation, which you all, I'm sure, waiting for, about your emotional brain, the amygdala. <clears throat> Ludger Tabatsman asked. Thank you, Krish. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, first of all, I think I have to open my presentation. Yes, and share your screen. Yes. Share my screen, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so can you see the screen? Yes, very well. Thank and you. you can hear me as well. Very well, thank you. Okay, so and I have about 20 minutes time for this presentation, I understand. So hello, everybody uh, on the other side of the globe. It's a pleasure for me to present uh, to this uh, audience. I'm, uh, I'm afraid I grew a little bit older than I was on that photo. <laughs> like, Chris, I have to send you a new photo. Uh, that's what I thought when I saw the picture, which is maybe <laughs> 10, years of, 10 years or so ago. OK, so for the next somewhat 20 minutes, I want to talk about the amygdala and the emotional brain. My conflicts of interest are given in, in forms of uh, paid lectures, talks, and workshops, and also book publications, but as you uh, pointed out, Krish, most of the books are in German, so there is no conflict of interest with respect to this audience today. What am I talking about in, in, in the next uh, 20 minutes? Well, first of all, I want to briefly dwell on the question, what is it about? Uh, what is it at all uh, when we talk about emotion? And I want to present to you uh, an idea of mine to, to kind of grasp the, the, the concept of emotion uh, as a uh, pre-analytical knowledge system. And I want to tell you later what I mean by that and contrast it to the more analytical knowledge system uh, and explain how different neuronal networks subserve these two different major uh, knowledge systems and what this might mean uh, for neuropsychiatry and, and, and for the clinical uh, diagnosis, diagnosis and therapy we might discuss at the end of this brief uh, presentation. Now, what is it at all uh, when we talk about emotions? The word emotion comes from the French word émouvoir, uh, meaning as much as to move something. So in the word emotion, there is the behavior, the moving. Uh, it, it's an integral part of, 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 the, uh, of the original concept of emotion. It's not that old, basically, uh, by the way, emotion. It um, uh, was coined in the 19th century. So it's two centuries, but it's not like a 500-year-old concept. Still, the term emotion is ill-defined. It's Purely, poorly delineated to other effective terms and concepts like feeling, sentiment, sense, effect, or other emotional or feeling-like uh, words and concepts. And there is 
no unique and scientifically consensed uh, theory and definition of emotion. So even though everybody talks about emotion and everybody somehow knows what emotion means because everybody knows his or her own emotions, still the concept is rather vague. Already in the 19th century, Darwin dwelt on the topic of emotions and here you see his famous book uh, on the expression of the emotion in man, in animals. And I think uh, he makes a very important point Charles Darwin in uh, uh, highlighting that emotion is not unique to humans, but obviously animals also do have emotions. In a late paper by Paul and Mendel from 2018, uh, the authors try to define emotion along the following criteria. They define emotion as a multi-component response, a subjective, physiological, neural, cognitive response to the presentation of a stimulus or event. So emotions always do have conscious or subjective features. They're always balanced, i.e. they are positive or negative. They vary in intensity, so they can be very intense or mild, and they vary in time, so they can last long and they can last very briefly. And also, um, hang on, I have to move this away. They um, are always event induced. So I think that's a very important observation that you cannot detach an emotion from an event which induces the emotion. Um, in, in my book uh, dated from 2003, I uh, defined emotions as a pre-analytical knowledge system. And still, I think that this is a, a concept of emotion that is able to explain a broad variety of the features that are linked to this phenomenon of emotions. Again, I pointed out emotions are induced by events. So for example, if you are sad or if you are angry, uh, the angriness or the sadness comes not from its by its own, but it's induced by something that happened in the environment. Uh, emotions always integrate complex situational information and the integration contrasting to the conscious based not a rational knowledge system uh, in emotional information processing it's more pattern based it's very fast it comes along like this so you don't have to think it through but it's there it's very fast and it's non-analytical and uh, emotions always do have a behavioral goal so either they mean that uh, animals or humans who do have emotions want to approach something uh, or to leave something. So either they want to fight or they want to flight uh, or they want to spit out something, for example, in, in the emotion of disgust. But always emotions are linked to behavior. So you don't have any emotion without an, a behavioral impetus. And that I think is very interesting as well. Emotions are communicated to other animals. So it's a kind of knowledge system or uh, information processing system that is not only focused on the individual, like for example, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the rational knowledge system, but it's also focused on a group. For example, when, when uh, an antelope sees a lion and, and then it shows, displays emotional behavior in, in, in that it flights, then this emotion springs over to the other animals, even though they don't see the line at all, and they um, engage into the same emotion and into the same behavior. So on close analysis, you can in fact uh, distinguish two kinds of higher knowledge systems in the humans, a pre-analytical emotional knowledge system and an analytical insight-based or rational knowledge system. And here, I have summarized the distinctive features of these two knowledge systems. Emotional information processing is fast, rational is slow. Emotional information processing does not need attention. You don't have to focus on something that is happening, but it just appears. Whereas when you think a problem through in kind of rational uh, information processing, you necessarily need attention. Uh, the mode of emotional information processing is implicit, 
pattern based, uh, that of uh, rational information processing, explicit, conscious, uh, and analytically based. The level of abstraction is low in emotions, high in, in, in rational thoughts. The affective tone is high in emotions, low in rational information processing. The behavioral relevance is immediate and direct in emotions, so you immediately want to fight or flight or freeze, uh, whereas in, in rational uh, information processing, it's indirect and modulated. And communication takes place in emotions almost always, whereas in, in conscious or rational information processing, it's not necessarily the case. Um, with respect to anatomy, this brings me to the uh, focus of the talk for the next 10, 15 minutes. Just uh, as a brief quiz to, 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 to make it uh, more interesting, these are examples of emotions in humans. And uh, you immediately will be able to recognize the emotion, I guess so, but still you might feel like myself that sometimes it's not so easy to put a word to the emotion. But uh, even though if you don't know what the emotion is, so if you just think it through, so what, what does this mean? Or what does this phase mean? The behavioral impetus is quite clear. So if, even if you don't find the word for the correct information, uh, emotion that is depicted here in these phases, uh, the behavioral impetus is quite clear. And, and, and that's just to illustrate uh, to you by real life situations or faces in, 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 in this sense, uh, the relevance of the criteria that I have presented to you in the table just a minute ago. Now we can go through this quite quickly. So th that's just the idea to, to uh, illustrate to you the behavioral relevance of emotional information processing. Now, with this image, I want to illustrate that even though we often talk about basic emotions like fear, fright, disgust, happiness, anger, uh, the emotions in fact are dynamic and discrete. So they are, they, they, there are like categorical corner points of, of, of emotional core concepts, but it's not that either you have this or that emotion, but emotions may vary in a very dynamic and very discrete way. Interesting to point out also that emotions are uh, uh, multi-ethnical, so they overcome cultural and ethnic barriers. As you see, uh, you won't have problems in the, the uh, decoding emotions from human beings, from, from other cultures, and even uh, across the animal uh, human being border, it is, as you know, quite easy to, de to decipher emotions, for example, of a dog. And uh, this is a Klein final brief uh, film. I hope you can hear it. Well, that's just to make sure that there is a, a, a emotional range. So emotions are not the same across all different human beings. And uh, talking about, for example, autism a minute ago, it's obviously a big issue when you, when you diagnose and treat patients with autism. Uh, plus, I wanted to point out with this video that emotions are embedded in rational knowledge. I mean, uh, I, I, I learned that Harry Potter is popular in India as well. And uh, Hermione obviously uh, talked about emotions in a very rational way. And, and, and the, the, the brief conversation made clear that emotions are not uh, absolutely delineated from non-emotional, rational thinking and behavior, but it's embedded in this behavior. But now uh, I want to come to the amygdala because that's the focus of the talk. So what about the amygdala? The amygdala, you all know, are at the core of that neuronal network that, is, uh, um, uh, that underlies emotional information processing. And here you see the amygdala, an almond-shaped small structure in the uh, mesial temporal lobe of the brain. Uh, here you see it, uh, f uh, an image from our early papers where we try to measure the volume from the amygdala. So again, uh, an, an almond shaped structure in the mesial temporal lobe uh, 
uh, just medial to the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Even though we generally talk about the amygdala as if it was a unique single structure, that in fact is not the case. Uh, the amygdala uh, uh, comprises 13 different subnuclei. And, and at this image, you can see just major subnuclei and they do have different functions. So when talking of, about the amygdala, it's important to point out that even though the word sounds as if it was a single structure, in fact, it is not a single structure, but it contains uh, lots of different subnuclei. And with this image, I don't want to go into too much detail of neuroanatomy, but uh, with this uh, image, I just want to illustrate that the amygdala also, not only within the amygdala, there are 13 different subnuclei, but also within the brain, there are lots of different networks that are related and linked to the amygdala. For example, the temporal cortex, the occipital cortex, the frontal and cingulate cortex and the parietal cortex. And um, given the briefness of time, I, I cannot go into details of all these anatomical connections, but I just want to, want to point out at this uh, stage that cortically and subcortically, the amygdala are linked uh, bidirectionally in most of the cases to several other networks and parts of the brain. And these are examples for subcortical uh, connections. And with this uh, brief image, I just want to point out that there is also a neurochemistry of amygdala functioning. So uh, the amygdala is linked to different other networks and sub areas of the brain. And it were these linkages, the, these connections run on different uh, uh, neurotransmitters like glutamate and aspartate and GABA, for example, when it comes to connections to the cortex, acetylcholine, when it comes to the connections to the basal nucleus of minot or dopamine when it comes to the connections to the ventral tegmental area. Now, the fact that the amygdala are not a single structure, but are linked to other critical brain structures for emotional uh, information processing is not new. The first famous name who pointed out this fact was Paul Broca. Uh, when he defined the grand lobe limbique, the limbic lobe, already in 1878. The next milestone was uh, the definition of the Parpus circuit by James Parpus in, the, uh, in 1937. And even though if you look at this part of the, uh, of, of the image, the amygdala is, does not uh, appear, it is in fact linked to the hippocampus complex within the concept of the purpose uh, circuit. And uh, a very influential thinker was the psychiatrist Paul McLean, who died uh, somewhat 14 years ago. And he pointed out that, and this is linked to what I've said earlier about the pre-analytical emotional information processing and the analytical rational information processing, that the brain comprises different uh, subsystems. You have a very old system, what Maclean called the reptilian brain, and this is uh, um, underlies pre-emotional uh, information processing, and it's called the paleocortex. Those brain structures like the pons, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord, which belong to these oldest parts of the brain, are called paleocortex. Then you have the mammalian brain, and that's where the amygdala play a key role. I come back to that. On the next slide, that's called archicortex. And uh, I explain to you in a minute why, how this is to be distinguished from the analytical neocortex. That's the latest development in evolution, uh, in human evolution. And that's responsible for what I called uh, analytical, analytical information processing. Now, Leonard Heimer, a friend of Michael Trimble and ours as well, uh, Chris, I guess you know him as well, uh, is one of the most famous neuroanatomists of the last decades. And he included all non-isocortical structures uh, uh, into uh, what he called the greater limbic lobe. 
What does that mean? Isocortex, allocortex, mesocortex, the newest brain, the latest uh, brain, the neocortex, uh, which makes up 90% of the brain in humans, is defined by a defined six layered structure. You can see it here. And uh, when you do measurements on, on MRI images, it's very easy to uh, recognize. The old cortex, the cortex of the, of the limbic brain is called allocortex. There you have only four or even fewer uh, cell layers. And, and then you have the mesocortex, which is a transition zone between the two. Now, the old anatomy, th th that's the old anatomy of the 60s and 70s, the pre hyma anatomy stated that you have two separate cerebral systems, the isocortical system, and the anatomists thought that the isocortex, so uh, the isocortical brain is the neocortical brain, it's basically the same, that it links to the striatum, I'll show you in a minute what that means, and that the allocortex, the limbic brain, important for information, uh, emotion processing, uh, links to the hypothalamus. And this idea was based on rat anatomy since it was much more difficult to get human brains for an anatomical studies. So what does this mean with respect to information processing? The old idea of the 70s is that we had two different system, the iso isocortex connecting to the uh, striatum and to the thalamus. And then you have the limbic cortex connecting to the um, hypothalamus. And then this is uh, another view, the limbic cortex connecting to the hypothalamus and then to the brainstem. So that was the old idea that you have two separate neuronal networks in the core of the, of the limbic system was the amygdala, I'll show you in a minute. And at the core of the isocortex or the neocortex responsible for analytical information processing was the isocortex. And the question arose, how can these two systems interact with each other if they are so much separated? And that's where HIMA comes in. This is, I don't want to talk to you to this very, very complex uh, figure. I just want to point out that here you have the amygdala and the amygdala are densely connected to the brain stem and the hypothalamus. And uh, that was knowledge from the 60s and 70s. And at the same time, these experiments uh, became viral, we would say today. Let, you, let me show you briefly um, what you, this brief film. A clearer experiment was performed with cats. In this classic example, the hypothalamus, the rhythm maker, was implanted with electrodes. Could it be responsible not just for rhythms, but also for rage? The switch is turned. Then the switch is turned off. So indeed, the hypothalamus does control certain types of aggression. Yet, when another region of the hypothalamus is stimulated, we see another kind of aggression, the quiet biting attack, the silent stalk after a rat, and the calculated kill. Turn off the switch, and the kill is forgotten. Now, you might ask yourself why I'm talking about the hypothalamus. That's why this image is, is important. At that time, the scientists thought that it was purely the hypothalamus with which you can sort of uh, steer emotional behavior. But uh, this image tells you how densely the amygdala and the hypothalamus are interconnected to each other. And uh, nowadays, you know that by stimulating these basal amygdala related structures, you can directly trigger very emotional uh, behavior. However, this behavior, of course, is not embedded into the whole contextual information process. And based on the old anatomy of the 60s, uh, uh, the question how come that emotional behavior is embedded in more rational uh, isocortical based behavior was difficult to answer. And that's where the latest anatomy uh, came in from Heimer. He discovered that uh, you have the classical analytical brain, the isocortex or the neocortex connecting to the striatum and then to the pallidum. Uh, 
And then you have the allocortex, that's the limbic brain. And here you have the amygdala, which is at the heart of the limbic allocortical brain. And that's what uh, Heimer uh, discovered that this uh, amygdala is connected to the ventral striatum and um, the ventral pallidum. And within this concept, you have not, you don't have two totally separated systems of uh, isocortical based rational information processing and amygdala based emotional information processing. But as you can see here, there is a transition from classical isocortical motor behavior, premotor behavior to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So these are neocortical structures and then it fades over to the greater limbic lobe, the allocortical structures, the older uh, mammalian brain structures. And even at the subcortical level, you have transition zones. And in particular, in the ventral stratum, both circuits come very close. And this is most likely, according to nowadays knowledge, the kind of binding site where emotional information processing, amygdala-based, very stereotypic, uh, very fast pre-conscious is intertwined and related to more rational isocortical based uh, analytical information processing. And I just, for sake of time, jump over this image and come to my summary. So what was the point of, of my talk? Well, first of all, I wanted to point out that the amygdala sounds like a unique structure, but in fact, it's the core of a network of the limbic uh, network or according to Heimer, the greater limbic lobe um, that according to the thinking of the sixties, there were two different and separate grand systems of information processing, the limbic emotional network and the rational isocortical network. But based on the anatomy, on the anatomical discoveries and work of Heimer, we now know that it's not so separated at all. But there is but one brain, i.e. Uh, from a brain perspective, uh, the, the, these differences uh, go over. There, there are no categorical differences, but, but it, it's more uh, a, a, a transition zone. There is no true dichotomy between limbic and neocortical loops, but they cross talk with each other. And the allocortical structures that I have um, uh, discussed a minute ago. Emotional, emotion processing is a pre-analytical knowledge system. That's what, what I started with, focusing on the fast and dirty assessment of situational patterns, evoking emotions, i.e. behavior. And uh, they, of course, are amygdala and limbic based. Analytical information processing focuses on a slow and thorough judgment about specific and rather abstract features of given situations. Both systems run on different networks, the amygdala and extended amygdala and greater limbic lobe for the information, uh, emotional information processing on the one hand versus the isocortical striatal networks uh, for the more rational classical analytical information processing and the new anatomy by Leonard Heimer uh, uh, dwelling on the extended amygdala, that was the Heimer concept, explains how these systems interact and intertwine in optimizing human information processing and behavior. Um, both knowledge systems do have their own capacities, strengths and weaknesses. I think it's important to recognize that even though the, the, the rational isocortical system is, is the later one, the newer one, if you want, so from an evolutionary perspective, it's not the better one, but it has, does have different strengths and different weaknesses. Both systems, both knowledge systems can be disturbed in different ways since they rely on different neuronal networks and the extended amygdala is a, a center, well, that I have said already a minute ago. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Lurka. So we we will do a few questions now. Uh, perhaps mm -hmm. you could stop screen sharing and then we'll go back to... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for explaining so well the rational versus the emotional brain, the rational brain being the, the new cortex and the mm. emotional brain being the, the older uh, extended amygdala and the limbic system. Um, one question I have for you before I go to ask you other questions from uh, which are there in the, in the Q and A section uh, is, you know, are, some people tend to be rational predominantly. Some people tend to be emotional predominantly in their decision making. That pattern, how much of that is nature, how you're wired, and how much do you, of of that do you think is nurture? Uh, yeah. How, how you, what you're exposed to as you grow up and your role models and so on. Yeah, that's um, that's a difficult one, of course. Uh, I, I will come back to that on, on, on uh, during the second presentation when I talk about structure. Well, I think personality is um, well known to be coined by genes, but it is difficult to tell to tell apart because, of course, parents not only give you your genes, but they give you also uh, your uh, education and, and your nurture. So, um, for example, thinking of my autistic uh, patients, of course, it's very obvious that autistic patients often do have autistic parents, uh, but still that doesn't solve the problem because they have the genes from their parents and they have uh, the experience and the education from their parents, at least most in the time. I think um, it's something like 60-40, either way. Uh, 60 which and 40 which? I would guess 60% uh, nature. But okay. that's my guess. I mean, it, it, it's I, I, I don't know sober data which could uh, prove this proposition. But that what that's my guess, basically, my scientific guess. <laughs> okay, that that it's the way you're wired is is more perhaps more dominant than the way what what how you were brought up. I think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, since you spoke about autism, there's a question about, you know, young people with developmental disabilities uh, often uh, have meltdowns and uh, the, the amygdala hijack mechanism, uh, you know, which gets the rational brain back in operation seems to fail in them. Uh, so what it is, what, what do you think drives that is the question? What do you think, uh, you know, uh, uh, what works in people who are not developmentally disabled that fails to work in people with autism, for example. When they get their, dry, their meltdowns, you mean? When they get their meltdown and they're not yeah. able to come out of the meltdown. They stay yeah. in that emotional meltdown. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, if you have such a very severe anger attack, for example, uh, and, and you think about what's the underlying Neurophysiology, of course, I, I would uh, assume that amygdala-related processes are critical. Amygdala is probably very important. The amygdala itself, the basolateral amygdala, is probably very important for arousal effects. But uh, the same is true for the hypothalamus. That, that I thought was quite interesting, that little video, because it shows you that uh, hypothalamus and amygdala are densely uh, interrelated to each other. Um, but of course, I mean, what the arousal is, is what I call structure, and they cannot modulate that. The behavior itself, when they start shouting, crying, hitting, and beating, it, it's not only amygdala most of the times. I mean, the more stereotypic the behavior is, the less embedded in specific situational features the more likely is that you only have subcortical mechanisms underlying the behavior. But in most of the times, I would think, at least based on my clinical experience, that there are also aspects of what I call problem behavior. Uh, of course, they sort of learn how to guide attention and, and they might have secondary benefits from specific behavioral patterns. 
And that's, I think, but that's the topic of the second talk. It's very important to kind of analyze the difference between what I call structural features, because structures cannot be changed uh, from what I call problem behavior. Because problem behavior, of course, is changeable. And um, they might still be, even though they're very aroused, they might still be able to control their, say, spitting, biting, uh, shouting behavior. Uh, but for that purpose, we have to understand exactly what's going on in that situation. There's another very interesting question about uh, uh, from a person who says, I am, uh, you know, I have OCD under treatment and I am very emotional and tend to get carried away by uh, my emotions. Uh, so, how do I control my emotions and act rationally? Is the question the person's asking. Well, first of all, I, I think you have to recognize the patterns. The fact that you are that uh, that you are getting aroused is probably difficult to control. Arousal, I would compare to pain, for example, and nobody is able to control pain. Pain happens, and uh, if, 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 if a sudden pain shoots into your lower back, you cannot control it. But of course, you can control what you do next. I mean, if, if you then lay down on a bed, or if you, if you move, or if you do exercise, that's a behavior. And that, of course, you can control. And I think it's important to recognize the, the behavioral, the, 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 the structural patterns, because those are not changeable from and to recognize the distinction to the behavioral patterns, because that's where you can uh, try to learn uh, to modify. It. So, for example, if you're getting aroused, if you're getting, if you have OCD and um, suddenly uh, 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 the, the urge to wash your hands shoots in, that's like a pain. You cannot control it, but you can recognize such urges come across me when I'm stressed. And then you can start analyzing what exactly was the stressor in this situation. Was it that it was too loud? Uh, was it that I have drunk an alcohol the day before? Uh, was it that I was in a quarrel with a friend or a family member? And then you kind of can indirect modulate that you identify triggers for the stressor. Thank you. There's a question about emotional granularity, your ability to put words uh, to describe your emotions and how that can be protective. Is that something you're familiar with, Durga? Well, yes, uh, we, we, we use it a lot with the term alexisthymia. Uh, many people with autism uh, are alexisthymic, meaning they are not able to recognize their own emotions. And I personally think that there is a link to the concept of theory of mind or cognitive empathy or the ability to uh, intuitively see or perceive what other people want, what they have in their mind, that's a theory of mind. I think that this is a pretty much talent-driven phenomenon. Uh, based on my experience with autistic people, I know that many of the autistic people, they just don't see it. So if, if somebody, if, if, if an autistic uh, girl uh, is being asked in, in, in the pedestrian area, what's the time? She doesn't realize if the, if the man just wants to make contact or if he's interested in, in, in the time. So this capacity is like a talent. Either you have it or you don't have it. If you don't have it, you can train it a bit, but, but you are not going to be an expert. Um, however, when you don't have the talent and, and, and it's very severe, you can kind of analytically learn it like emotions, and that's the same with the alexithymia. Uh, if you don't have the, the ability to recognize your own emotions, then, uh, for example, anxiety becomes uh, tummy ache. Uh, you have this odd feeling in, in your stomach, and uh, basically it's, 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 your, it's because you have anxiety, but since you don't realize that you are anxious, then you think, oh, I have a stomach ache. 
And um, it is very important to recognize that you don't have the ability to distinguish anxiety from uh, stomach ache. And then of course, in a second step, you can conclude from your, when you then have stomach ache, you could ask yourself, maybe I'm anxious. Uh, then you haven't learned it. You, you haven't learned, you, you, still you don't perceive intuitively the anxiety, but the rational insight that your, tumor, your stomach ache could be anxiety rather than uh, having eaten something wrong is very important uh, for your further behavior because then you can modulate your behavior and you can adapt to the situation and you can adapt to a situation where you don't uh, realize your own emotions. It's a very important thing, uh, the granularity of being able to perceive one's own emotions and the uh, alexithymia in brackets and the emotions of others, but it's very difficult to train if you don't have it. It's, it's, you, it's easy to, you can well overcome it analytically, but you cannot train it synthetically. There's a question about how a similar event can provoke two very different responses. Um, well, perhaps one emotional and one rational. What would you say to that? Well, of course, it depends on the on the context. For example, I mean, if if if, if the 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 context variables, in particular for emotional information process, uh, processing, are very important. And um, I, I know it from myself. I mean, sometimes you, you suddenly have an emotion, and you then have to go and, and analyze why do I have this emotion. And then in hindsight, you you recognize, oh, I have seen something, and that reminded me of something different. And, 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 and then you get the, the associative chain that explains uh, why you got this uh, emotion. The problem with the emotions is that they just come about. They, 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 you, you don't sit down and produce emotions, but they just come uh, in a situation on, on, on their own. And then you don't always uh, consciously know all these contextual informations. The, the fact that the situation that in this situation you have uh, emotion A, and in the next situation you had emotion B, is probably caused by different context variables that you are not aware of. So you only think the situations are the same, but in fact they weren't the same. But you were not aware of the critical difference that produced the other information uh, emotion. Thank you, Ludger. There's uh, several questions, but one that gets repeated. Uh, what about techniques like mindfulness, spirituality, and meditation, and emotional regulation? How do they do that? I I, I think that's uh, actually very important because it, it it's it's it links uh, it connects to the to the embeddedness of the emotional information processing system uh, into the uh, higher uh, rational information processing system. I think what we do when we meditate is that we, to, to begin with, it's a rational decision. Uh, I mean, it, it, it doesn't happen to you that you meditate, but you decide to meditate and, and then you engage into a, a predefined and a stereotypic learned behavior. And I think what you, you, you start off with, uh, if you want, so isocortical network activity, but then you mod modify the emotional brain. And it's, it's a specific um, uh, mode of interaction between the two knowledge systems. That, that's how I would uh, take it. Uh, that's what you do, and of course, it's, if, if it works, it, it's, it's very, it's a very good technique, because you, uh, in doing so, you get access to the emotional information processing system, which is normally rather difficult to control. You, you cannot, I mean, emotion information processing is a little bit like pain. You cannot uh, 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 steer it voluntarily. 
I mean, if, if we were able to stop our pain but intentionally, everybody would stop his or her pains. Of course, it's not possible. <laughs> that's the critical point with pains. And that's very similar with emotions. You, you cannot directly intentionally uh, sort of stop being happy or you cannot stop being afraid. Uh, but by in engaging into a, a, a trained uh, um, a behavioral patterns uh, like meditation, you use your rational voluntarily system to modulate systematically the emotional brain. And, and that's why it's so helpful, I would think. Thank you.